Hello and welcome to Intro to VR Cameras, presented by Black Public Media. My name is Philip Sanchez, and I'm a virtual reality producer and 360 photographer. For the past five years, I've been using VR to create doc-style stories that shed more light onto social issues affecting underrepresented communities. And when I first started making VR films, you had to visit a bunch of different websites and YouTube videos to learn one small piece of what seemed like a huge puzzle of a process. And today, to be honest, it's not that much better. That's why Black Public Media asked me to pull together this series on VR cameras to help start your journey into VR. They've also commissioned my friend Jonathan Williams to dive deeper into the VR post-production process, so be sure to check out those videos as well as the rest of my Intro to VR camera series in the links below. In today's video, the second in our series, we're going to answer the questions, what does a VR video file look like and how is it different from working with a traditional video file? Because for me, I had to wrap my head around what my footage would look like before I could even properly plan my shoots out in the field. Okay, so let's get started. When we're working with VR 360 files, it's displayed in what's called an equirectangular format, which is what happens when you flatten a sphere into a rectangle. And because the sphere has essentially been unwrapped into a rectangle, it has some weird wavy distortions in the middle and some stretching at the top and the bottom. It's the same kind of distortion that you might remember from elementary school when you looked at the map of the world on the wall and it had that wavy look to it and Antarctica was bigger than Africa. It's the same concept at play. Now it's important to remember when looking at an equirectangular video file that the left side of the video meets up with the right side of the video. So if there's action or a character moving seemingly off screen stage left, it will immediately reappear stage right. So, as we mentioned before, in order to create 360 videos, we have to sync and combine a minimum of two video streams to get full coverage of a 360 sphere. Some VR rigs use as many as 24 or more cameras for cinematic quality. We call this syncing and combining process stitching. Now, there are two technologies involved in stitching. There's template-based and optical flow stitching. Template-based is the starting point for all stitching. It's not an either or situation, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It uses a pattern unique to each camera or lens to connect the video streams together to create that spherical video. Optical flow takes it a step further and uses AI to process the areas in between the lenses, which informally we call the seams, and calculates what the next pixel should look like. This makes movement from one lens to the next a little bit more fluid and a little more seamless. There are varying levels of stitching software available. There's free in-camera and desktop versions, as well as fee-based third-party stitching programs that use optical flow. Optical flow stitching is often desired in professional projects because movement across seams from one lens to another is noticeable, especially action or objects closest to the camera. The technical term for these seams is parallax. Parallax is the concept that describes when a pair of cameras are side by side, much like our eyes. The left camera or eye will inherently see slightly more of the left side of an object than the right camera or eye. Similarly, the right camera slash eye will see slightly more of the right side of the same object than the left camera slash eye. But there is a focus point at which both cameras or eyes will see the object equally. However, anything moving in front or beyond that focus point will appear disjointed as it crosses the seam. And right now, 360 video technology doesn't dynamically change focus with the viewer's attention. Since it's static, we run into this issue of objects crossing seams all the time. Optical Flow's AI helps us fudge that transition and makes it a little less noticeable. So we've talked a lot about spheres and spherical video today. And if you remember high school math, the zenith and nadir are the top zenith and bottom nadir of a sphere. These are usually mentioned when talking about photoshopping out tripods and other unsightly equipment that's been mounted above or below the camera. Or sometimes, cameras in a horizontal array will have distortions at the zenith and the nadir because you have all these video streams coming together and pinching at the poles. Okay, well that's it for now. Hopefully this took out some of the mystery of working with VR video files. In our next video, we'll talk about a common confusion between VR resolution and field of view. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you next time.